ready? Okay, I'm going to pray here, and we're going to team teach. We'll see how this works, um, especially when you don't know exactly where you're going. <laughs> but we trust the Holy Spirit will bring clarity. So, Father God, we come bef before you, God, with ready hearts, hearts that long to hear what you have to say to us. Father, I pray that destinies would be accelerated, God, that destinies would get back on track, that we would be moving and going forth deeper into the things of our Heavenly Father, that we would grasp a hold of them, your truth, your wisdom, and we would run with it, God. We wouldn't let it just sit there, God, but that we would hold it and cherish it, God, and do something with it. So, Father, we yield ourselves to you, and we ask that you would speak directly to our hearts, God, all the things that we need to hear as individuals, that we would hear them that you would teach us, that you would correct us, that you would build us up, that you would love us, that we would know your voice, we would recognize it, and we would respond to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to tell some of you, well, actually most of you, I don't think we're at the women's um, meeting. <laughs> Anyway, probably only Pastor Jared knows this story, but um, I just wanted to start off with the story that a few months back um, when I was at work, minding my own business, I just had this interruption in my thoughts, and it was God. And I was sitting there documenting on the computer, and I overheard conversations happening in the hallway. I couldn't see the people, but I knew who they were. Um, I knew the particular family. I work in a doctor's office, so people are in and out of there all the time. And I heard these kids and this mother walking down the hallway, and I knew the thoughts that people had towards this particular family and the kids. And in the world, those thoughts are, wow, that's a pitiful situation. The kids are dirty. They're neglected. They're not really taken care of. Um, like, it's too bad, stinks to be them. It's too bad they were born into that. That's, those are all the thoughts that I was aware of, and I, you know, I've overheard, you know, people's comments. And all of a sudden, you know, I was thinking about those two little boys' situation, and they have a mother. They actually have two mothers. Um, the mom's in a lesbian relationship, and dad's in jail. I mean, it's just a broken, dysfunctional family. And Mind you, I'm not thinking about them. I'm doing my own thing. And God starts speaking to me that though the world thinks, you know, it's too bad about some people's situation. It's too bad what they were born into and what they're suffering with. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they just don't, those kids, they just don't have a chance. You know, that's what the world says. And God said to me that, um, they, it doesn't matter the darkest of the situation that we were born into. You know, my mind often thinks of, you know, international things. Well, even things locally that are going on. But like, like if you've seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire, you know, they cripple kids and then they use them to go bring money, you know, to the person who owns them. And they make them become beggars, not because they that child needs food, but because someone else is doing it for the money. And you know, all the horrific things you could think about like sex trafficking and, and women being abused and oppressed, just bad stuff. And God was saying, doesn't matter really what you were born into because we were born to know him. That's the bottom line, that those kids do have a hope and we have a hope. Most of us probably had great family situations or good the rest of the world's standards. We have him, certainly. So we're in the kingdom of God. But that to know that we were born to know him 
it doesn't matter who we see and who we know and who we think about and all these pitiful situations, they have a chance just like we had a chance. And that's all that matters. And someone needs to tell those boys that they were born to know Father God. So anyway, that was just the story that um, I felt like I should share before I give you a couple scriptures. The New Living Translation, um, I like this for these couple scriptures. It was actually in the New Creation Realities book in chapter 16. Great chapter. Um, 1 Corinthians 1.13 says, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then, in exchange, he poured God, God's goodness into us. Isn't that a great picture? I just kind of like how it explains it. For God took the sinless Christ and poured our sins into him, and then in exchange, he poured his goodness into us. And there's just a couple concepts I wanted to touch on, but really the bottom line is, you know, this is all worthless if, we, if it doesn't become reality to us. So that's been my prayer. God, make this a reality because the Lord knows I am working on this stuff myself to go deeper, to respond quicker, and to God when he speaks to me. And this is something that I'm preaching to myself too because I need it. I need to go deeper. Um, so Robert has said for many years, he, he prays, you know, at the beginning of the year, what's your um, New Year's goal? And he's like, um, just to be aware and conscious of God. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> Come on, give me something more. Like, what are your goals? What are we going to do this year for the kingdom of God? Let's write it down, you know. And we all know that the leadership of the Holy Spirit, like Ron Bruce has recently been teaching, you know, you don't need to write it down. You don't need, you need to follow the Holy Spirit. And usually that isn't what you plan to do. You know, God changes our plans. But that's, I feel like that's something that we need to become ever aware of the presence of God and to be conscious because don't you know that we forget it all the time. I'll go through half of my day sometimes with the busyness of work and say, oh my goodness, Father, I've just been a little bit stressed, a little bit on edge, kind of not knowing what to do, feeling some feelings. I'm not even sure why they're there. And I just, I need to, I need to speak to my Father. I need to, to, get right back into his presence because that's what E.W. Kenyon talked about. That was one of the concepts about um, the righteousness, that we are the righteousness in God, that at any moment, at any time, we have instant and immediate access to our Father God, that there's no shame, there's no um, cowardliness in us, that we're just there boldly, right there in the middle of our life, in the middle of our situation, that there we are, righteous before God, and we have a listening ear, we have an audience with him. And that just blows me away. <laughs> um, the other concept out of 1 Corinthians 1.13 talks about wisdom, right? And we've been hearing a lot about wisdom. And from the moment I started really trying to find God in my own life when I was in high school, I remember reading Proverbs, and I love the book of Proverbs. It just speaks to me. I felt like it answered so many questions I had, but yet it's so deep, and there's so much more I need to know, even though I've read it like so many different times. But the wisdom of God is when we know and understand truth, and we we have the ability to apply the truth correctly the right time and the right situation that we're actually using that truth right ew kenyon breaks it down a little bit and he talks about it and we've been hearing about it from ron bruce that we have the spirit of wisdom on the inside of us so it's not enough that we are and this is something we all know we all hear about it but i'm here basically just to encourage you and i pray that I'm following the Holy Spirit, that it's not enough to stand back and just kind of look and see the truth. 
and know it and be a spectator of the truth, but to actually allow it to become a reality and flow through our life where we're actually walking in the truth and doing something with it, using it correctly. I mean, we can try to use truth and the knowledge of God in certain situations, but when we don't apply it the way it's designed to be applied, it's not the true wisdom. So we have to use it according to his purposes. And I don't know what you guys thought about the term. He talked about us being masters. Do you remember that in the book? Um, that we're masters of situations and circumstances and we're masters of love. And he talked about some different things. But I just wanted to ask you really quick, just shout it out. What do you think of, like, what's a master in your mind? What do you think a master is? Okay, wise person. They're good. Can you get me some water, please? Okay. Excuse me one second. I have a tickle in my throat. I will be right back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I'm so sorry I just walked away, but I had a really big scratch in my throat. Okay, so a master is someone who takes dominion, who is wise, who's really good at a skill. Is that what you said, Patricia? An owner? So, yeah, a couple of the things I just looked up in the dictionary. Um, a master could be a ruler. They could be highly skilled and proficient at something. And they um, could be considered like someone who gains control or is an overcomer. Okay. So I think that kind of describes us in God's eyes, right? Here's a couple scriptures. So we are the head, not the tail. Deuteronomy 28, 13. We are the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. We are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony, our testimony, Revelation 12.13. We are more than a conqueror through him who loves us, Romans 8.37. We have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Ephesians 1.17. We have the greater one living in us than he that is in the world, 1 John 4, 4. We have the gift of righteousness and reign in life as a king, Romans 5, 17. We are not oppressed and fearful and a fearful people, Isaiah 54, 14. We are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, Colossians 2, 10. So it's safe to say that we have the upper hand in situations, right? When it's not about dominating people um, or being a better person or being prideful. It's about stepping it up into the kingdom of God and actually operating and flowing in his spirit and releasing him into the atmosphere in our life. It's not enough just to know him and to talk about him, hang out with friends that know him and believe him. Like Francis Chan said in his one YouTube video, he's like, you know, I tell my daughter to go clean her room and she doesn't come back and say dad I memorized what you said I'm gonna go clean my room that doesn't make a parent happy right like go clean your room and your kids like okay I know what you said go clean my room then that's like what we do we're like God we know what you said you know to live it but we just repeat it back but we actually don't do anything with it we don't actually use the truth that we know so um, if we're going to be operating in the concept of understanding, like truly deep within ourself, to know that we are the righteousness of God and, and to use the gifts that we have and actually access that in our daily life at work or when we're raising our kids or wherever we are, and to know that right then it's time to go to his presence 
because we are the righteousness of God, that we need to know when we need to do that. And you, we better do it. We better be going into his presence and operating in that righteousness that we have more and more. And, and this is just a process, but it's been the prayer of my heart to be conscious, to be aware of his presence, that he's right there and we need to access him more than we're doing right now. And decisions can sometimes be stressful for some people. I would say they're kind of stressful for me. Like, I mean, sometimes just deciding where to go to dinner is just, you know, over the top. I'm like, I don't know, you decide. I really don't even want to make the effort, you know. But we need to be able to follow the spirit of wisdom and make these decisions. Um, for instance... So if we're willing, right, if we're willing, we do have the ability to follow through on what we know to be the best course of action in any given situation because the spirit of wisdom is on the inside of us, right? So if we're willing, we have the ability to make the decision and follow the best course of action in any given situation. And as I've learned from Pastor Sharon in the last couple years on deeper levels and has become more of a reality in my life, that when you don't have the peace of God, you need to take a step back and find out why you're stressed, why things are going on. Are you following his spirit? We have access to that wisdom, the wisdom of Jesus. He was made wisdom for us. And we have the Holy Spirit, our comforter and leader and guider on the inside of us that we need to be walking in peace, right? We need that. We desperately need that. I don't even like going to the grocery store making a list, like, you know, decisions on what to fill the refrigerator with. That's kind of stressful for me sometimes. So I, I think that, I mean, and that's the most basic level. That's not like life and death stuff, but the other decisions, taking a job or not taking a job, or who you're gonna marry or not marry, or where you're going with your life, those are critical, right? Because I prayed at the beginning that we would be launched deeper into our destinies today or get back on track to where we're going, right? And that's my desire, is that we would be walking in our destinies with the people, the right people we need to be walking with and fellowshipping with them. So the last concept I'm just going to mention before Robert comes up is he talks about like being a master and the whole aspect of love, the love of God, right? That's something I get excited about to talk about because love never fails, right? Love never dies. It never ceases because our Father is love. We have love in us. We have his nature. So we have the love of God in us. And the love of God, I like to think, like, make a picture in my mind, you know, just imagine, like, I don't know, I guess on, like, Disney movies or fairy tales, you know, you, the magical things, you can see things, spirits, like, wisping in the air or um, those fairies, and you can see stuff that's happening, magical stuff, you know? Well, when I think about the love of God, I think about, like, a force, I don't know, Star Wars or something, you know, the force. Like, there's an actual physical force that is actually moving from the depths of your belly when you choose to release it, right? <clears throat> so, love is forceful. It, it actually changes the atmosphere. So, when you feel like you're at the end of your rope, we say this a lot when we've married people together, kind of preach them and <laughs> preach to them and lift them up for a short <laughs> minute in the ceremony. Like, don't give up because your feelings are completely opposite um, and you're not feeling lovey towards your partner. That's in the context of marriage, but in any relationship, because we need people to release the love on. We can't be locked in a closet all the time and say we have the love of God. The love of God needs to be released and it needs to be purposefully planted in people's hearts. People are out there waiting. They need seeds of love and we may not know what that love is going to do. We may not see what we want to see or what we expected, what we thought would happen when we were walking in the love of God, but that's not up to us. 
God will accomplish what he wants. When you release his ways, when you release the love out of your life, it will do something. And that will just release a burden from you, from what you want and what you expect from that person, those situations. You just need to trust him and you just need to do it and you just need to let it flow. But that requires, I would say, high levels, depths of maturity to be able to do that because it pretty much always goes against your flesh. It goes against what you want to do. It goes against what anyone would tell you to do. But it's the higher thing. E.W. Kenyon talked about, um, you know, someone who's, people are getting mad at each other and someone does something, manipulates, and the other person, like, kind of explodes. And he's like, the one who made the other person mad, like, he kind of dominated and had control. Now, we all know we have personal responsibility, but he's just talking in the natural that these people are just, like, reacting and responding, reacting and responding. They're just wishy-washy, and they're just in the natural. But when someone enters in and releases the love of God, that's the higher thing. That's the kingdom of God, and it always wins. We always win when we, when we um, choose to side with God, when we release his love. And love is always seen through an action. We've showed a video a couple times here um, by it. Iris Ministries made it, Heidi Baker in Mozambique, and it says love looks like something, right? They dug wells, water wells for these African kids. They, um, they discipled and they built a school, and they're doing all these things, and that's what love looks like. And we all know it's so far from a feeling. It's an actual force that is released through our actions in hard situations, in good situations, but we need to embrace those hard times because um, that's when we're really getting our foundation. That's when we're going deep with God, when it's really hard to love those people and to make the right decision, but we choose to follow God and he just enforces us and he, show, he, he enforces it and he shows us his faithfulness to such a higher degree, we wouldn't know how faithful he was if we didn't see him through those difficult times. I'm going to read this scripture, and then Robert, you can come up. Um, this is in the New Living Translation, too, and it's a scripture we're so familiar with, but we need it on a regular basis because we forget, right? Because I believe that, and I'm speaking to myself, if we truly believed this, our life might look a lot different. If we really actually believe this, Romans 8.37 Who then can ever keep Christ's love from us? When we have trouble or calamity, when we are hunted down or destroyed, is it because he doesn't love us anymore? And if we are hungry or penniless or in danger or threatened with death, has God deserted, deserted us? No. Remember, we just learned God doesn't speak to you through circumstances. He speaks to you through an inner witness, not what's happening, not what's coming against you. That's not God. No, for the scriptures tell us that for his sake, we must be ready to face death at every moment of the day. Wow, right? We are like sheep awaiting slaughter. But despite all this, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us, enough to die for us. For I am convinced that nothing can separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels won't and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow or where we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus when he died for us. You can just leave that there. When we um, went to Guatemala, um, Megan and I went twice with uh, Paul, uh, Paul and Diane Agnew, and we were sitting down there. And the, the leader down there, his name is John, and I was sitting there with Megan, and we were all talking, and he turns, he looks at me, and he says, he says, no offense to you, Robert. He said, but you married up. <laughs> I said, John, I, I know that. <laughs> so you didn't, you're not telling me something I didn't know. Um, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Same with a husband, too, by the way. 
Um, as I was sitting there and just listening to Megan speak, the scripture kept coming to my mind. It says, God did not give you a spirit of fear, you know, but a power. Let's stop. <laughs> but a power, <laughs> love, right? And a disciplined, peaceable, sound mind. And um, listening to Brother Ron Bruce this last week brought, stirred so much up in me. And I feel like, I, right now I feel like a coach. You know, I would coach track. I was in tra- involved in track and I would coach. And I, 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 sometimes I don't know what I feel like when I'm up here, but today I feel like a coach. And um, we're on a winning team, guys. And I'm so excited about that. I'm so excited about the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm so excited that I can speak in tongues and get a download from heaven. And this brother, I mean, I liked speaking in tongues before this guy showed up. (laughs) And I would do it a lot. But now it's like every little chance I get, you know. And I was texting with Greg this week and... uh, Greg Brown, and I said, he said, what are you up to? What are you doing? So I said, I said, I'm praying in tongues every single chance I get. He, and he never texts me back instantly. <laughs> but he did this time, like, me too. <laughs> and uh, we are just all excited about that. When I went to college, I went to college um, to run. I was never super excited about school. Um, if it wasn't for track and field and a scholarship, and hopes of, uh, you know, maybe, you know, doing something with running. I never would have went. And so as freshmen, we come into this uh, training camp, and we're all sitting in the lobby, and the coach is just kind of interviewing, just sitting down talking with all the athletes. And I would always just sit kind of away and kind of listen to what he was going to say, you know, to try to prepare for what kind of questions he was going to ask me, because I always felt at that time like, you know, if I was on the spot, I could never answer questions. I was scared. I was scared of that. I was scared of people asking me questions. I used to be. And he was sitting there talking to them, and he'd say, well, do you really want to be a great runner? And he'd say, now, don't answer me right now. He said, that's not a question that you can answer right now. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, it is. Why, you know, why can't I answer that right now? I want to be the best, you know. And then he would say, You'll answer that question in two years. When you find out what it really takes to be a great runner, then maybe you'll, because you don't know right now. And I'm feeling like God, you know, that scripture, we're counting the costs. And I feel like I'm, God has positioned the body of Christ, and there's a bunch of people who've counted the costs. And they've said, I'm going to follow Jesus. No matter where he goes, this isn't even written on here, so don't think I'm reading that. I came up here with, with zero notes for the first time in my life. Um, I'm excited because, you know, the Bible says that there was people that started out with him, and then they left them, and it said, well, all that did was sh- it showed that they were never really with them from the beginning. And... I was talking with Pastor Sharon on Thursday night, and in the spirit, we are we we're in a, a new place. Can and can you feel that? I mean, I've been in church for a long time. I can say a long fourteen years, but I've the whole time I've been actually in it. You know what I mean? People have been going to church for thirty years, and the first twenty five they weren't paying attention. When I got saved, I came to church. I started paying attention right away because I got. You know, I was a substance abuser. I got delivered off of drugs. The Lord just went, bam! And I was like, wow, okay. I called the first, you know, Ron said, how do we get into this in the first place? We called him Lord, right? I'm sitting in a room by myself, you know, having a, a drug problem, and I say, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was like, whoa, what did I just say? I just called him Master. I just called him Lord. And it shook me. It shook me up. And I've come and we've heard words. At least this is how it felt to me. Maybe it didn't feel this way to you. But for the last 
10 years, it's just like everything's just so out in the future. Like one day the church is going to be like this and one day, you know, and it's just like, well, what about now? Like what about today? And it was just like out there, out there, out there, out there, out there. It's just like right now there's a stirring in my heart and, I, and it has to be in yours because it's the same spirit. And I'm feeling so um, like I can't lose you know, and it's for real. You know, you can try and talk yourself into something. And um, I went on a, a mission trip four times to a dangerous country. We don't say the name on the air. You know, we went with Pastor Al and, you know, the country. And I want to say the first time I went there, I trusted God with my life or with my, with my eternal salvation. I trusted him with my eternity. And I said to myself, you know, if, if I were to get killed here, I'm, I'm going to heaven. And I would stand up on the stage in these huge revivals and, you know, uh, Bruce would preach and, you know, 15,000 people would get saved. And I'd stand on the stage and I would be thinking, if a bullet comes <laughs> across the stage right now and bam, whacks me right in the middle of the head, I'm going to heaven. And I was all fired up, you know, and I'm like, this is awesome, and people are getting saved, and people are getting healed. And I trusted Lord with my eternal salvation, and I came home. And then I came home, and my life was so different, and... You know, I thought everything Megan said for a couple of days, I thought it just, in my, it was a battle. It was such a battle going in my mind. Was we, that we're, she just wanted to argue, and she wasn't. She wasn't wanting to argue about anything. I was just, I got a battle started in the spirit. I was like, we're not spending any money on flowers. We're not doing this and that. We're sending every cent to there, and we're getting, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I'm going on in the weeks, and then I'm looking around, I'm looking at my mom, I'm looking at my wife, I'm looking around at my friends, and I'm hearing Paul's voice, and he goes, in the Bible, he said, you know, it'd be better for me to go to heaven. He said, I'm in a hard place, you know, in the, in the King James, it says, I'm in a straight betwixt two, which I like that. He said, I'm hard pressed. <laughs> That I don't know, do I want to go to heaven or do I want to stay here? He said, but you know what, for the ministry, for you guys' sake, it's better for me to stay here because we need to walk together. We need to do this. And then I heard my own thoughts in my head going, if I die, I go to heaven. I'm like, no, wait a second. No. So the second time I went back, I trusted him with my life and my eternal salvation. And I said, I am not going to die. It's not okay. It's not okay if a bullet comes flying across the stage and hits me in the head. You know, I'm still going to heaven. Yeah, of course. But I need to go home and see my wife. You know, I need, you know, it's like, why are we in such a hurry? We have eternity. We've got one chance on this side. I saw Francis Chan. He had his rope. You ever see his rope display? And he says, imagine I have a rope and it starts here and it never ends. Just goes all around the world and he had this little piece of and I stole this from him I actually preached this sermon myself and how many of you know if it's the Holy Spirit it's not you're not stealing it from anybody because the Holy Spirit owns it and if that preacher claims he got it from the Holy Spirit then he shouldn't have any problem with you taking it because it wasn't his right and I heard Pastor Bob say that somebody would say something good he'd go I'm going to give you credit twice and after that it's mine <laughs> and I like that and I want to say this too, sometimes, sometimes when we give credit to some, to some other name, to a name, it can discredit what we're saying because that other person doesn't like that guy. So say I say, well, I heard Kenneth Copeland say this and this and that, and I love him. Maybe you'd like him. Maybe you don't like him. So I just don't say the names anymore. And I'm not trying to take credit for anything, right? I'm just going to say, I'm going to say, if it's God, it's God. I can say it, right? But he had this little piece of uh, red tape on it. And he said, this is your life on earth. It's this big. And eternity is the rest of the rope. And it never ends. And he said, and we're worried about this. And we spend all our life on this. And nothing 
not preparing for that. And I heard, <laughs> I'm just going to say this. I'll give some credit. I'll give some names because you guys know these guys. I heard Dale Armstrong say, people tell me if you speak in the Spirit, you know, for three hours a day, I think you're nuts. And he said, I tell you, if you don't, I, if you don't do that, I think you're nuts. <laughs> he said, because we're a spirit being. We're spirit beings. We need to pray. And so I'm encouraging you to pray in the Spirit. I'm not standing here saying, look at me, I pray in the Spirit, and I'm awesome. No, no. I had somebody come up to me recently, and they said, you know what, Robert, I, I'm sorry. I want to repent to you over thoughts that I had that I never spoke. But I had these thoughts. And they said, well, when I first heard you preaching, I thought you were really arrogant. And that all your stories were me and God and God and me and this and this and this and that. And, and he said, it sounded like it was about you. You know, the stories were about you. He said, but I heard you say something the other day. And the Lord convicted me and said that that's not, that's not true. And I said, you know what, I, I thank you for telling me that. I said, because it's going to help me be a better teacher. I said, because I'm not going to change who I am, who God made me to be in that way, because I believe, you know, and the Lord taught me through Aaron here, that the most powerful way that I can teach is through my relationship. And it is, all my stories are about me and God and what he's doing with me and him, me and him, me and him, me and him. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And I said to him, I said, you know, I'm going to tell them that, um, how do I want to say this? I said, if there's one thing I know, one thing I know, it's not about me. I said, trust me, you can ask my wife. <laughs> I know that. And I want to encourage you to have your own relationship, your own stories. You know, and Ron Bruce, when he was teaching, he would say, this should be normal. We should all be having this, okay? And what happens sometimes is arrogant people tell these stories, and they act like they're so awesome, and they want glory for themselves, and that's just the way they are. But like Pastor Bob said, we need to take, you know, eat the hay and spit out the sticks. If there's something that we can learn, let's learn that. And I want to encourage you to tell your stories. Get, it, get your stories out there. And don't worry. The, the, the truth will come through. And one night, I, I was reading this um, New Creation Realities in, in chapter 17. He, he talks about Jesus never talked with anybody that was born again. They were all, none of them were born again. All his disciples, while he walked the earth, were not born again. Because they couldn't have been born again, right? He didn't shed his blood. The blood didn't come before the Father. A new creation, reality, wasn't a reality to them. And I thought about that. I'm like, wow, how much I enjoy fellowship. And I enjoy, like, we'll have a, a home group or something, and we'll have true fellowship. And I'll leave, people will leave my house, or I'll leave, the, usually I leave their house and drive way, way far away back home. And it's like, I just experienced the commanded blessing of the Lord. You know, the Bible says, um, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. There he commands a blessing. And I'll go to some home groups, I'll go to some gatherings even like this. And I'll experience us dwelling together in unity, and I experience a commanded blessing. And it's so amazing. And as I was sitting there, after I read chapter 17, I thought, how much I love true fellowship. I started thinking about Jesus. As a man, he never experienced it. He never experienced it. And I thought, no wonder he was always wanting to get away and pray. You know, he's like, I love you guys, but man, I got to get away from this flesh. I got to go see my father. I got to do only what I see him doing. 
I got to do, say only what I hear him saying. I can't be influenced by you guys. You guys aren't born again. You guys, you know, all this stuff. And I started thinking about Jesus. I thought, wow, Isaiah 53. You know, he was acquainted with our sorrows and our grief. You know, he was fully God, but fully man. He experienced all this stuff. And I started, I found myself starting to feel bad for Jesus. I thought, okay, well, that's not right. Because I was just saying how much I enjoy this, and he never experienced that. And the, the, it says, greater works will you do, that we, we would do than he did. And I always thought to myself, well, he raised people from the dead. How, what, how, what's greater than that? You know, okay, you're dead. Now you're alive. I don't see anything greater than that. And then I read chapter 17 in this book. And like Pastor Bob and I were talking, we don't want to just sit here and just talk about the book. We, you bought this book. <laughs> read this book, right? Read it. Greater works... Jesus never, while he was here, led someone at that time to be born again. We have that. We can do that. That's greater. A new creation reality, his spirit's inside of us. His, his blood's already shed. It's already there. Now we can walk in that. We can walk in, in a love that they never had. Now, think about this when you want to um, make fun of the disciples. Say, so, I can't believe Peter did that. Or even David, you know, how can't, can't believe he did that? It's like, it's more, it's not amazing that they sinned. It's more, it's more amazing to me how holy they actually were. They didn't even have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them like we do. I mean, Peter cut the guy's ear off. Well, I know guys, my friends probably would have cut his head off. <laughs> especially if you didn't have the Holy Spirit. So my, my goal today is just for us to see Jesus in a new way. Um, if you have, you know, a lot of friends, if you have a, a great parents, um, and you enjoyed that in your life, you know, I, I did. I had great parents. I enjoyed that. But some, not everybody has. And we have good, you have good friends. Not everybody has a lot of friends, Jesus can identify with you. So if it's you, you can know now, wow, Jesus walked the earth. He never never really had a true friend. Not like we can with the Holy Spirit, not with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had the Father, and he depended on him, and it was enough. And so we can walk with the Father. It can be enough. But he wants us to have friends, too. He wants us, he, he enjoys his brothers or his children dwelling together in unity. So I want you just to take that concept and um, just bam, bam, get it in your heart that when you're ministering to somebody who's never had a dad, who's never had friends, or they're lonely, they're, they, they just um, never experienced true fellowship, we can minister out of the love that Jesus had for them, that he never had that either. I hope this is making sense. Um, it can be an encouragement. It just blew me away in a good way, like in the spirit. just blew me into a different realm. And I was like, I love you, Jesus, more now after reading chapter 17 than I did before. What you did for me. Because I know how much, how fellowship, how important it is to me and how much I enjoy it and I love it. And he never had it. Not with anybody else. But with his dad he did. One night, when I was, you know, away rescuing, helping rescuing children, I had a, it's, it's emotional. How much time I have? A few more minutes. It's emotional. And, I mean, really emotional. You know, you, you will, 
you will cry <laughs> like you've never cried before. You see those things. And I went up on the roof, and I was crying out to the Lord. And uh, I was just thinking all these things. And the Lord showed me my purpose in the trip. And he said, I called you on this trip not to talk to or instruct people. I didn't call you as the leader of the group. I didn't call you there to instruct um, anybody. He said, I called you here. I didn't, he said, I didn't call you here to talk to them. I called you here to talk to me. And I was like, I just, I lost it. He called me there because he wanted me to talk to him, to intercede for our trip to him. And I thought in my heart, not pridefully, I thought, and I'll explain, I've got the best job of all, of any of us. He called me there to himself. And I began to realize, and this is for you, whatever you are called to do in the church, whatever you are called to do in your life, if it's God calling you to it, is the most important thing there is. If God calls you to sit up and play that guitar with everything you have and your love for God, you have the most important assignment in the church. Not pridefully, that's what he told you to do. And if you are teaching the kids, and I would teach the kids, and you have the most important job in the church, whatever it is, I don't care what it is. If God says, I want you to, you know, the toilet overflows, you know, I've done that, right? Got, the, <laughs> got out the plunger, you know, that right there, that's the most important thing I got going on. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that for God. And my encouragement to you is we're on the winning team. We got the Holy Spirit. We can't lose. Let's get in tune. I'm not saying that you're not. I'm encouraging you to do it more. And let's follow him with everything that we have. And let's take every assignment that he gives us every day as the most important thing because he is the master he is lord and if he tells us to do something it's important no matter what it is so let me pray with you guys father you are awesome you are awesome and we thank you that you chose us. We thank you, Lord, that you called us out of the darkness and you brought us into the light because you are good. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the body of Christ here worldwide. I thank you that you are stirring up your people. You are uniting our hearts. We say yes and amen, Father, to everything you want to do and say. And help us, Lord, when we sin. Help us, Lord, when we get off track. Help us, Lord, to take that and just throw it behind us and continue to walk for us, walk forward toward you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, that your voice would be known in our hearts more and more every single day. We thank you for this, Lord. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.